so yes, my name is Ann Clothier, and uh, one time I had someone say to me, um, well, that's a, a neat business name, but what's your real name? <laughs> and because uh, I've always been drawn to historic fashion, um, I've recreated some of uh, clothing. I tend to focus a little bit earlier with 18th century, um, but uh, definitely I've always loved um, being able to uh, enjoy and examine uh, this clothing. In fact, if I had really thought far enough ahead and done a bit of digging at my parents' house, there is a photograph of me that was taken at Grant's Cottage as a probably 12-year-old dressed in historically adjacent Victorian clothing. <laughs> uh, so I uh, have a long history with Grant Cottage. Um, I grew up just over on the other side of the mountain from Corinth, or in Corinth, and uh, my family has a farm there. And the family has been, um, had that land for a very long time, many generations. In fact, um, one of my uh, ancestors, um, with the family story, and because you have to love the family stories, um, that uh, would be my great-great-grandfather carried his three-year-old daughter on his shoulders over the mountain to go peer through the trees at Grant sitting on the porch. So uh, that, that there, there's my weird little connection right there. So, um, but, so I'm very happy to be here today. Again, I've always had a strong spark in my heart for, for Grant's Cottage. And uh, so I'm also here today from Brookside Museum. And uh, it is the home of the Saratoga County History Center. And we have over 30,000 items in our collection. And uh, that includes books and photographs and documents and chairs and stuff like that, but a lot of textiles. And when I was preparing for this, my directions right. When I was preparing for this today, um, this is the phrase that came to mind because I was going into the collection and frolicking. Um, because again, I love uh, spending time with antique clothes. Now, a couple of disclaimers. Um, the things I'm showing on the screen are items from the Brookside collection. Uh, the pieces that I have up here are actually primarily from my own personal collection or a couple of pieces from the Brookside's education collection. Items that lack provenance or background um, that we do take out to schools and things like that. Um, but we do try to keep the items that are in our formal collection um, fairly protected and safe. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment too. Now that phrase Victorian is referring to a very broad expanse of time. And so Queen Victoria lends her name to the entire era. Uh, so from 1837 to 1901. So when we say Victorian fashion, it uh, can cover a very, very long period of time. And you can see the silhouette change uh, in that time as well, and just the general concept of fashion and preferences and details. Now this area, fashion is certainly very important to Saratoga Springs, and earlier than that, Western <coughs> Spa, um, with people coming to these resort communities to take the waters. And <coughs> people were certainly coming here for their health, but people were also coming here to see and to be seen. And so I've always loved this stereo view. Uh, this one is uh, of the Congress Hall. Um, that front porch and all of these gentlemen lined up peering at the photographer. And I have to wonder if there were some young ladies who felt this way about coming to Saratoga Springs because there were families that were coming here to marry off their daughters and to mingle with high society. And so to be put on a display like this, um, again, those peering eyes. So part of that, if you were coming here to be seen, <clears throat> a big part of that is fashion, how you were appearing, how you looked. And so I have a variety of pieces from the collection that we'll look through up here on the screen. And then I'll also go through some of the pieces over here on the table as well. 
Now, if anyone's curious and wants to do your own frolicking in the Brookside collection, we have our own um, online collections database. And that one, the, honestly, the easiest way to find it is to just Google Brookside Museum and the words past perfect. And uh, so the official address is brookside.pastperfectonline.com. And uh, that is where you can do keyword searches, you can browse the collection, and you can see some really great pictures of some of the items that we have in our collection. Now, I also have to admit, I was very careful when I was um, <coughs> doing the screenshots for this, I realized. After I had put all of these screenshots into the PowerPoint, I looked it up at the very top, and it was a very good representation of my brain because there were, and I count, 26 open tabs. Um, so I had to crop that down. <laughs> so, but yes, this is what you see when you open up um, brookside.pastperfectonline.com. And again, you can search for different things. You can search the word taffeta. You can search uh, the word petticoat, things like that if you're looking for fashion-related items. But if you're doing general research as well on a family member or a place, um, you can uh, keyword search surnames and communities and things like that. And it is a handy resource. And uh, if you do find something that you would like to see in person or spend some time with for research, you can contact us and set up a time uh, to view that item or that document. Now this piece here uh, is uh, one that I found uh, in the collection. And uh, it's a very um, oh, uh, tailored uh, suit jacket um, for a woman. And uh, this one uh, also is marked with the owner's name. And Mann, M-A-N-N, -N, uh, that family actually lived at the building with this Brookside Museum um, for a period of time. So it has a very direct connection to the institution. And um, looking closer at it, um, it's a really neat sort of crossbar striped uh, silk. And my favorite part, if anyone here is a cat person, angry kitten buttons. <laughs> and a couple more views showing the back. And uh, the wonderful uh, sort of uh, pattern matching that leads down uh, to the center lower back, and also a view of the interior as well uh, with some of those seams. And uh, here's a view from 1885 uh, showing, uh, some, again, some of those tailored, um, you could even say slightly masculine fashion inspired kind of thing, um, and uh, that has a similar sort of uh, look to it. Now this one, um, looking at it in the online collections database didn't look as interesting. Um, the description is delightful. The photographs didn't really do it justice. And um, so this is the wedding gown of a woman uh, named uh, Georgiana uh, when she wed Frank Wheeler. And we even have the exact date it was worn, October 16th, 1872. So this is a nice way uh, to peek in on a very specific season within a very specific year. And I did endeavor to get some better photos. <clears throat> and so it is an interesting uh, color. Um, and it's some, it, depending on the light, it can be some more of a sea green, um, sometimes a little bit more of a sage green. And it has lots and lots of bows. <laughs> and so um, this view, um, let's see, over on this side, this is uh, the front of the jacket here. Now the back of the jacket in some ways is actually more interesting and has more visual appeal um, because this side over here with all these bows going down the back, um, that is the back. And then right here, um, it splits and that is for the bustle. And um, there, it's actually a three-piece uh, garment. Um, there's that bodice, there is a skirt, but then there's also this overskirt um, that has the buttons continuing down the back and the ability to flounce up um, that skirt. And sadly, one thing that happens a lot with these silk garments um, is 
the splitting or shattering of the silk. And you see this a lot in areas where there's perspiration. So a lot of times with these uh, Victorian silk garments, uh, the underarms are in very rough condition. And because it was um, difficult, nay, impossible in some cases, to truly launder um, silk gowns. Because if you do, it actually removes some of the, the sizing and the fabric treatment, and it becomes almost an entirely different fabric. And if it's already been stitched, that can be detrimental to the garment as a whole. Um, but if you're wearing something and you have sweat into it, and if it happens to be a warm October day, um, like we've had some warm April days lately, um, this uh, could happen to her gown. And so spot cleaning was possible. Um, and uh, But again, this is something we see. If you've also seen Oh, the crazy quilts of the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. Um, sometimes you'll see um, these pieces of um, silk. You might have one that looks pristine, perfect, brand new, and right next to it there's another piece of silk that it looks like a cat has just gone and just shredded it. And sometimes that's also due to the way the silks were treated, um, that they had different additives um, put on them to make them shinier or to make them make a shushing noise as you enter the room. And so this is something that in the museum world is called inherent vice, which sounds very naughty and very scandalous, but inherent vice is just the idea that <coughs> something that is part of the object you're trying to preserve, that part of it is also trying to destroy it. Um, so it's, it can be very frustrating and very challenging in a museum environment. Now the next one, uh, this one is uh, a bodice and skirt set. And so this one's referred to as a two-piece day dress of light blue cotton sateen, uh, printed with brown roses, uh, standing collar, three-quarter length sleeves, and so a bit better views of this one. Um, so this would be a nice uh, sort of day dress. And you can see here, this one's um, a a little bit earlier in the uh, 1880s. And so it has buttons, no angry cap this time, sadly. Buttons down the front, they're fairly plain. Um, we can also look inside the bodice and see some of the construction details and the buckram, the sort of uh, reinforcing sort of uh, interfacing that uh, is helping to hold some of these pieces more firmly in place and give them structure. Now the bottom of the skirt, has these wonderful pleats and that could kick out as you were walking. And uh, here's another view of those roses right here. Now this piece, sometimes I have to admit, um, the descriptions that you find in the online collections database um, can, um, I don't agree with. And that when you have a museum with a long history, you have a variety of different people with different backgrounds who are entering the information, who are interpreting these pieces. And sometimes they get it spot on, it's perfect, it's great. There's other times where I'm going, well, let's think about this. And so this is a piece that um, what I found in the collection, um, I, I, what I did was I went frolicking in the collection, took all the photos, and then went to the collections database to see what it had to say about them. And so when I found this, I, I, again, it gave me a moment of pause. And so this is referring to it as a child's reversible wrapper of printed cotton and um, center front button enclosure. And so <coughs> the size of that doesn't seem quite right. Um, and these wrappers were common. Uh, a wrapper was sort of a less formal um, sort of outfit that you could wear. Um, and it was uh, kind of the way that people might wear uh, leggings and a tunic today, a little bit looser kind of thing. You could still potentially go out in public in it, but um, it wasn't your best outfit by any means. But I also had a, um, let's see, oh my great, great, grandmother, um, after her husband died while working on the railroad, his co-workers had gotten together and bought her a sewing machine so that she could make a living making wrappers for women. And so 
uh, that was something that I learned about growing up. And so outfits similar to this, loose sort of wrapping gowns. Now this one, looking at the dimensions, looking at the size, looking at the, where the waist falls as compared to the hem, and looking at how loose it is and how lacking in sort of tailored details, um, Anyone have any ideas what this could be? What my hunch might be? Any guesses? It could be really rare if it is what I think it is. <laughs> yeah? And it's a maternity. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. This may be a woman's maternity wear. Um, and so this would be more of a sort of down to knee length, and then you'd be wearing an additional petticoat underneath. Um, but it's very loose and flowy in front, kind of like that, uh, those 1950s uh, <laughs> um, maternity wear jackets that have very little tailoring or shaping. And, um, all, and again, looking at the dimension of the arms, um, I think that this is a maternity jacket. So which again, would make it fairly unusual because often these clothes would be remade. So after this was, woman was done with her pregnancy or, or having children, um, she would probably either take this and maybe turn it into a child's outfit, or she could add in some darts and pleats and make it into a little bit more form-fitting wrapper for herself. Um, but this one, I think, has actually survived um, as an unusual example. Now this next one here uh, is a wonderful silk, um, and it's this crossbar sort of tartan plaid purple kind of green kind of, uh, it's got a lot going on with it. And when we look at it here, it's got that fringe, um, has this great collar up front, and the fringe is in surprisingly good condition. That or someone at some point in time spent a lot of time working on untangling fringe, because often when you find these garments, that fringe is a knotted mess. Um, but this one, good shape. A couple of close-up views to show that very vibrant color. And again, that wonderful forest green fringe. And some views of the inside with uh, some cartridge pleating. And one thing that the description mentioned on the database was talking about how it had been drastically let out under the sleeves. And so that's that blue material that's over here. And so they, we'll go back to that description there. Um, bodice appears to be let out under arms dramatically, probably for use as a costume. And that's something that happened to a lot of these garments over the years. Um, young ladies would go digging through their mother's, their grandmother's trunk and say, oh, I've got a pageant coming up at school, can I use this? Oh, there's going to be a costume ball coming up, can I use this? And so a lot of times these garments were altered. A lot of these times these garments were used up and destroyed in the process of being used as costumes. And an example that we have in our collection um, the great local photographer named uh, Jesse Sumner Woolley uh, documented Alston Spot and greater Saratoga County life uh, throughout the 1880s through about the 1920s or so. And uh, he took a lot of photographs of people in dress up, essentially, um, be it for pageants and school plays, sometimes for centennial celebrations. And a lot of these views have people wearing clothing that is blatantly from decades earlier, where you can just picture they went digging through the family trunks in the attic. And the most blatant example of that is in this image right here. And so this is documented as 1905, but if you look at the gowns that these ladies are wearing and the bonnets that they are wearing, um, they are from much, much earlier eras. And uh, this type of sleeve we see over here, that's much earlier, 19th century. That gets us into the 1830s or so. Um, these bonnets up here, uh, these very floral high bonnets, those are 1850s, 1860s. Um, and so these things were coming out and being seen. So I, 
and I had to go looking. I, I tried to see if I could find that plaid, that purple and green plaid gown in any of these photos. Not quite. I was hoping that I might, but about as close as we came was this 1860s gown right down here. But it doesn't look like it's quite the same one. All right, so that's um, the extent of what I have for the PowerPoint. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit briefly about what I have up here on the table. And we'll take a look and um, some of the things that one would be wearing underneath all of that clothing, those silk garments and things like that. And one thing that was very necessary were lots and lots of petticoats. And so here's an example of a fairly basic one here. And uh, it has a lot of uh, detailed stitching. Um, some of this was decorative, um, but would really only be seen by the wearer herself. <coughs> Um, some of it was structural as well, in that it would give a little bit more structure um, to the, the uh, understories. And here's another example of another petticoat with a very elaborate um, sort of lace along the hem. And this one has matching bloomers or pantaloons. And they are open. So this is a convenience factor. <laughs> and so this was a way to be able to answer the call of nature while wearing all of those layers of clothing. And I have a couple of examples of corsets up here. And often when we think of Victorian fashion, we are thinking of corsets. And so this one is um, looks like it's never been worn. It's uh, kind of a new old store stock and uh, absolutely teeny tiny. Um, one other thing that I, I want to address, there's uh, an idea that everyone was almost mutantly small back in the 1800s. And to an extent, yes, um, there were a lot of petite frames as we can see from this as well. Um, but there was still a lot of variation in um, stature, in height, in, uh, in body size. And sometimes, relating to this right here, there's almost a, <clears throat> oh, it creates an inaccurate picture for us when we see what is still left out there today. Because the clothing that was in the attic, in the trunk, that was a bit more typical size, or it could be altered, or could fit over a variety of different silhouettes. Um, that was the first to go. The teeny tiny stuff got left in the trunk, and because that would fit fewer people. And so there's a little bit of a bias today by what's left behind um, that there's this idea that everyone was teeny teeny tiny. And so again, we're a little bit skewed by what's been left because it was a little bit harder to use for this very purpose. And yes, there definitely can be things said about uh, nutrition, about waist training from wearing a corset from um, adolescence or pre-adolescence on up and things like that. There's definitely discussions for that, but not everyone was minuscule. <laughs> and here we have uh, a cage crinoline or hoop skirt. Boston Spa was actually a center of manufacturing for hoop skirts um, for much of uh, the center, center part of the 19th century. Um, so there were a lot of people in Boston Spa employed in making hoop skirts. Don't believe this is one of them. Uh, again, this is one is just for the education uh, collection for going out and showing off. But this was actually an innovation because earlier on, it was all petticoats, and you were, your legs were kind of swallowed up by petticoats, and uh, which would, could be very warm in the summer months. This actually gave you a little bit more freedom to move. So in spite of it looking like a cage, this was actually a little bit of freedom. <laughs> And this bodice right here is uh, right around the turn of the century. So 
Um, this one is in very rough shape. This is one from my own collection. And sometimes it's good to look at the pieces that are pretty broken up and uh, roughed up. Um, you can see the structural details better. You can um, get an idea of how they made these, how they reinforced them, the types of stitching. But another great way to look at these is to look at these inner seams that were covered and were not exposed to light um, to get an idea of color. Because at first glance, um, one might describe the print on this as being brown on white. But if you look at the inside of the bodice, it's a lovely sort of violet or lilac purple. And there were certain dyes um, that were very fugitive. Another one of those scandalous sounding museum terms. Uh, we've got inherent vice, we've got fugitive dyes. Um, but fugitive just means likely to go away, um, fade away. And so, but yeah, the inside of this shows a very nice purple print. And another great cotton print uh, sort of blouse here, again, more of turn of the century. And how's that for a shoe? <laughs> so that great um, cotton day dress we saw with those pleats at the base of the skirt, this is the boot you would see kicking out from underneath that as someone walked. And I have a couple of examples here of what uh, tweens and teen girls would be wearing. And so this one's getting a little bit more into the Edwardian era, just after the Victorian era. And But this wonderful peacock uh, bluish green silk and this tartan plaid uh, silk edging and uh, sash here with the lace neckline. I've always loved this one. This one's a little bit more utilitarian uh, and has some really great details and a really great uh, sort of print to this one. You can see, you can just imagine this girl going to the one room schoolhouse. And so, uh, but there's a mix of uh, machine stitching as well as hand stitching that you often see in these garments. And, uh, but uh, the girl herself might have even been involved in the making of her dress. Does anyone have any questions or anything that you're wondering about or anything you'd like to see more closely? Um, high stockings, and um, they might be held um, with uh, garters at the knee or also garters from um, a uh, less constrictive corset um, would be another possibility as well. So, but yeah, stockings that would come up to about here. I do have an example of a shorter stocking uh, right here. So, yeah. And of course, the young woman would also be wearing um, pant pantaloons or bloomers as well underneath that as well. So that is, um, it's a thin wire, a metallic wire. So, yep. again, very cage-like. Any other questions or anything you want to see? Bustle. Yes. Was the bustle like horse here? What was the bustle made of? It, it, did they go away? Quite a variety of materials were used for bustles. Um, there were cage versions similar to that hoop skirt that I just showed. Um, and so that had a metallic wire sort of frame. Um, but there were certainly ones that were more based on padding. So as you say, horse, ha horse hair, um, they could be filled with wool, um, even excelsior, like almost like wood shavings. Um, and uh, certain, and I think I've even heard reference of a, a feather one that'd be a bit warm, but comfy place to sit. Um, <laughs> so, but um, these were very common starting in the 1870s and then going away um, by, they, they became fairly small by the beginning of the 1890s and then were then pretty much gone. And so, um, it, but again, earlier on in the 18th century, there was a great focus on the hips. So in the 1760s, 70s, you've got these um, hoops or pads that are coming off of the hips. 
um, and paired with the stays, the 18th century version of the corset. Um, and then all that goes away at the beginning of the 19th century. And you've got these very slim silhouettes. And uh, then starting around 1830s to 40s, you're getting into those larger are you coming? There it is. And so, um, but there's a cycle of fashion because in some ways that sort of um, larger hoop skirts or crinoline skirts, very fashionable in the 1850s, 1860s, you see that come back a little bit in the 1950s with like the poodle skirts and such. The 1810, 1820, very slim um, silhouette with hardly any crinoline or petty, like floofy petticoats. Well, in the 1920s, you're seeing that silhouette that's very slim. Um, and so, in some ways, it just keeps cycling through in one way or another. And what's happening with um, anniversaries and centennial events, um, we have a great example of a wedding dress at Brookside Museum from the 1920s. But because it was one of the major anniversaries of the American Revolution, there was a lot of hearkening back to the 1770s. So this 1920s wedding gown has these weird little cagey bump outs of penier, the, those um, so side hoops, um, and uh, as a callback um, to the Revolution that they are uh, observing at that time. So we definitely see some interesting things with the fashion and how it cycles through and can be inspired so, by so many different things. All right. Any other questions or anything you wanted to see closer? Yeah. It's kind of silly, but with the hoop, how did they did it tie around the waist? I saw it had those things, mm -hmm. so they just kind of tied it up on the waist. It could be tied. Um, this one has um, almost like a buckle type of system. And so this did give some adjustability. Oh, I see. Okay. And so, uh, but would be uh, attached around the waist. Okay. Thanks. And again, this would be over top of the corset. So at that smallest point of the waistline um, that's being created by that corset, that's where this would, would sit. Um, so. Any other questions or anything you wanted to mention? Well, thank you very much.